Hello, and welcome back to our webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Ocean and Coastal Applications. We are now in week three, and we will cover animal movement and migration. We also have a very special guest, Dr. Mitchell Roffer, who will be giving a presentation on his fisheries-related work. As I mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you will be able to find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish. The Spanish translations will be available later. A link to view the recording of each week's webinar and the PDF of each homework assignment and a link to the Google form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us to keep track of who is viewing them. Once you register, you will be automatically taken to view the recording. Just a reminder, my name is Sherry Palacios and I am your instructor for this webinar series. My co-instructors are Amber McCollum and Cindy Schmidt. They are busy working behind the scenes developing materials, managing Adobe Connect, and communicating with you, our participants. Again, Amber will be your primary contact on chat today, so thank you, Amber. We so appreciate your enthusiasm for this webinar. Thanks for participating. So we'd like for you to recall from previous weeks the course objectives. They are to provide an overview of NASA Earth observation resources available for open ocean and coastal applications, including a basic understanding of remote sensing of aquatic systems, how to access and visualize NASA Earth science data, how to use NASA Earth science data, tools, and products for open ocean and coastal applied science issues, and to conduct live demonstrations of use useful ocean and coastal applied science tools. This week, we will be discussing animal movement and migration. When we combine in situ data, remote sensing data, and ocean circulation and biogeochemistry models, we can gain so much more understanding about animals in the ocean, where they've been, and how their habitat may change in the future. I hope your main takeaway from today is an understanding of how remote sensing data can be used to unlock the mysteries of marine animals. This week, we will first review some of the important concepts from last week. I will give some background on an animal's point of view of life in a moving ocean, an overview of ocean circulation patterns and why we may want to know more about ocean circulation when we talk about animal movement, satellite sensors used for monitoring ocean circulation, how physical oceanography models help us fill the gaps in observations of ocean movement in the past, and how models can be used to predict future ocean circulation. And then I will provide some background on why and how we monitor animal movement. Following this overview, I will provide a case study for how marine animal movement has been monitored through a program called Tagging of Pelagic Predators, or TOP. I will also give some examples of tools developed in partnership with NASA for use by the marine fisheries community. Following my presentation, we will have our very special guest, Dr. Mitchell Roffer, who will talk about his work on Roffer's Ocean Fishing Forecasting Service. After his presentation, we will return to the main presentation to wrap up, and then we will be open for questions. I'm really excited to have Dr. Roffer here today, and I think that you'll like what he has to say. So first, a review of some important concepts from last week. Recall from last week that we presented commonly used NASA satellites and sensors for ocean and coastal systems. These next two slides provide a reference to the different satellites and sensors that are used for ocean color remote sensing. The Landsat series, including the Thematic Mapper, Enhanced Thematic Mapper, and Operational Land Imager, are used to observe water quality. These sensors provide high spatial resolution, which is particularly valuable in coastal systems where small scale processes can dominate and are otherwise neglected by coarser resolution imagery. The Terra and Aqua satellites each host a moderate resolution imaging spectrometer, or MODIS, which senses both reflected visible radiance and emitted thermal energy. MODIS is used for land, ocean, and atmospheric applications and is used to infer several parameters or data products useful for understanding ocean biology, carbon dynamics, and circulation. The SWOMI NPP hosts spheres. This sensor is used for spectral reflectance and to infer chlorophyll concentration. 
The ISS hosted HICO, or the Hyperspectral Imager for the Coastal Ocean, for five years from 2009 to 2014. And finally, a satellite and sensor that is not yet launched but is under development is the Plankton Aerosols Clouds Ocean Ecosystems, or PACE. This proposed hyperspectral sensor is scheduled to launch sometime in 2022 or 2023. We talked about data processing level of the imagery you can obtain from the satellite sensors. These processing levels go from level zero, or the rawest form, to level four, which can include model output and derived variables. Level zero data requires the most skill and effort to process, and this is reduced as processing level goes up. So if you download level two MODIS data from one of the data portals I mentioned last week, it will require less work and skill than if you downloaded level zero data. There is different demand for processing level depending on the user's needs. Working with lower level data and processing it through several levels oneself permits the user to apply customizations that are not possible when obtaining data already processed to a higher level. So how does a person go about finding and downloading satellite data? We talked about several ways to access satellite remote sensing data. On the course website, we provided links to these data portals. The document with these links is listed under week two. These data portals and web tools included NASA's WorldView, the NASA Ocean Color Web Level 1 and 2 browser and Level 3 browser, the NOAA Coastwatch tool, Giovanni, and the USGS Earth Explorer. For example, here is NASA's Ocean Color Web. This website provides a wealth of helpful information to becoming proficient at accessing, processing, and understanding ocean color satellite imagery. I encourage you to explore the data access capability offered by the Ocean Color Web so that you may obtain data in the format that suits your needs. The Ocean Color Web website also helps you to access the CDAS webpage. Recall from last week that CDAS was originally developed for the CWIFS sensor and derives its name from the CWIFS data analysis system, but now it supports most U.S. and international ocean color missions. It is a comprehensive image analysis package for the processing, display, analysis, and quality control of ocean color data. CDAS is well supported with online tutorials, help pages, an active user community in the Ocean Color Forum, and an attentive and friendly support team based at NASA Goddard. It is freely available through the link at the top of this page. So those are some of the major themes from last week. Again, I encourage you to look at that helpful links document listed under week two on the course website. If you are interested in learning how to use Ocean Color Remote Sensing data, you now have access to the tools to do so. Now on to this week's topic, animal movement and migration. <clears throat> I would like to take a step back before we wade too far into the topic of animal movement. We as humans are so accustomed to living in a two-dimensional world that it can be difficult to overcome our biases. We are used to thinking of animal movement as occurring on the land surface, like the wildebeest migration, it occurs in two dimensions across the surface of the land. Wolves migrating or moving in Alaska, they move in two dimensions in the territory. And the mountain lion cub will grow up to patrol its territory within a frame of reference of two dimensions. In the case of a bird, which we may consider living in three dimensions, while it's flying, it's in a three dimensional frame of reference as it's in the atmosphere. But as soon as it stops flying or gliding, it too will fall from the air as its density is greater than the medium in which it resides, and gravity will force it to the ground. In the aquatic environment, there is more than just the surface. Below the surface of the water is a three-dimensional world in which the density of many of the organisms closely matches that of the water, and the frame of reference of these organisms is that they can move in two dimensions, horizontally, and in that third dimension, or vertically. Density governs vertical movement. The density of the water, of the organism, and the mechanisms the organism has to travel between density layers are important in this three-dimensional world. If you look at the image on the right, you will see that we as humans must go to great lengths to occupy this underwater world and we're not particularly good at maintaining our density or buoyancy in this case while we're there. 
In this image, the person on the left seems to have mastered staying neutrally buoyant, and he's okay with the little hand signal there. But that person on the right, well, she's still just trying to figure out how to hold still. Aquatic creatures have evolved to life in three dimensions, and there are numerous strategies they use to, divide, to survive, as this minke whale does here in the Great Barrier Reef. <clears throat> what does it take for an animal to survive in the aquatic environment? Well, it kind of depends on the size and the speed of the animal. Slow-moving organisms, which are typically microscopic, do not have the speed to overcome the viscous forces of water, and so they drift with a parcel of water. These drifters are known as the plankton, as you see on the left. Some examples of these little drifters include the microscopic radiolarians in the upper left, the Venus girdle tenophore, in the bottom left, a small crustacean known as a copepod up here in the upper right. These are also known as the insects of the sea. And while not microscopic, the egg yolk jelly in the lower right. Faster moving organisms, which are typically macroscopic, have the speed to overcome the viscous forces of water, and so they can propel themselves independently of the water current or movement. These are called nectin. Some examples include turtles, great white sharks, dugongs, and this vampire squid over here in the lower right. Why are some animals nectin and some plankton, or drifters? As I said previously, it has to do with size and speed. Slow-moving organisms, typically your microscopic ones, are slow-moving. <clears throat> the speed of their movement cannot overcome the stickiness or the viscosity of the water. This means they have a low Reynolds number. To them, the water is sticky. If you or I to be a plankter, we would experience moving through the world like we are moving through jelly. We would not get very far, and we would certainly not be able to move independently of the parcel of water where we reside. If you look at the plot on the right, you will see along the x-axis the Reynolds number and along the y-axis the speed of the organism. In the lower left, you have the plankton. Faster-moving organisms can overcome the viscosity of the water and so can glide through the water. Fish, sharks, humans, turtles, whales, they all have higher Reynolds numbers and can swim independently of the current. Some animals live as plankton in their juvenile stage and then grow into nectin. And then there's the special case in the copepods. They have the ability to use jet propulsion when the need arises to either escape predators or seek prey. Normally they live as plankton, but when needed, they do a little jump, flexing their back and propel themselves backwards. During this maneuver, they increase their Reynolds number and for a fleeting moment glide through the water as nectin. As you can see, the size and speed of an organism control how it moves through the water. Even though plankton are truly governed by the movement of the water and the nectin can move independently of it, it is often observed that nectin follow the patterns of water flow because they are following their plankton prey. So it is important to understand why and how water moves as it does in the ocean. The ocean is a moving system. Large scale ocean current patterns are the result of winds, pressure gradients, and the resulting flow defected, deflected by Coriolis and the rotation of the Earth, also known as geostrophic currents. <clears throat> and with the friction along the seafloor and con continental margins. Smaller scale ocean currents are also affected by some of these forces. If you look at the map on the right, you can see the large scale ocean, surface ocean currents you might be familiar with the fast moving western boundary current known as the Gulf Stream along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Or its conceptual cousin, the Kirishio, over here on the eastern part of Asia. Or the Agulhas Current, for those of our participants who are from Africa, this one is a current that's along the southern African continent. These currents mark the western boundaries of some of the world's major ocean gyres. Currents in the ocean can act as superhighways or barriers to animal movement. Currents carry more than living things. They are also important for the transport of heat, salt, and momentum in the ocean. As you see here, the previously mentioned Agulhas Current is an often overlooked source of very salty water into the South Atlantic. 
The current and the topography of the tip of Africa spins off rings into the Atlantic that later mix with the lower salinity water of the South Atlantic. This salty water helps to maintain the density structure of the water column. This image on the right shows model results of sea surface temperature to illustrate this phenomenon. Models for currents can be initialized with in situ measurements, such as with observations from the Argo Profiling Float Network, or from satellite observations of sea surface temperature or sea surface height. Which satellite sensors are used for understanding the moving ocean? This table shows a list of satellite and shore-based sensors used to derive current flow pattern, current velocity, current mapping, and altimetry of geostrophic currents. Sea surface temperature can be used to identify currents in the ocean by detecting contrasts across current fronts. Sea surface height, or SSH, is used to compute current velocity of geostrophic currents. The larger the gradient in sea surface height, the faster the current. A number of satellite sensors have been used to measure or derive sea surface temperature and sea surface height, and they are listed in the third column. On the bottom row is a shore-based system to map current location and velocity. This is with the High Frequency Radar Network. This is a system of shore-based nodes that triangulate using radar to determine wave swell direction, wave height, wave period, and current velocity. Data from HF radar can be used to track current patterns within tens of kilometers of shore. For applied science purposes, it is used to track oil spills, man overboard rescue and recovery operations, and larval population connectivity assessment. Observations of sea surface height can be sparse and just a snapshot of what is occurring at the ocean surface. Ocean circulation models are used to fill data gaps and also to describe water movement within the three-dimensional structure of the water column missed by satellites. Models can estimate flow patterns in the past and be, can be used to forecast the future. These models can be combined with biological models to estimate how a changing climate may change patterns of life or patterns of carbon uptake and the cycling of nutrients in the ocean. Ocean circulation models are powerful tools in understanding the ocean system. The Regional Ocean Modeling System is one example of an ocean circulation model. ROMS is a free surface hydrostatic primitive equation model discretized with a terrain following vertical coordinate system. It has been widely applied in many applications from whole planet scales down to the scales of estuary, estuaries. Forecasts include predictions of water temperature, ocean currents, salinity, and sea surface height. Now that you have an understanding of the reasons why we use models and the types of satellite data available for tracking animal movement, I'll give a brief overview of the types of in situ measurements we use to monitor animal movement. Spatial and temporal animal movement patterns are a central focus of animal ecology. Animal movement is driven by processes that act across multiple spatial and temporal scales and plays a major role in determining the fate of individuals, the structure and dynamics of populations, communities, and ecosystems, and the evolution and diversity of life. Researchers studying animal movement are usually trying to answer one or more of these fundamental questions. Why move? How to move? When and where to move? And what are the ecological and evolutionary consequences of movement? Data about animal movements are a key component of management and conservation actions. As terrestrial-based organisms, we may be biased in thinking of animal movement in two dimensions along the surface of land, <clears throat> such as the wildebeest migration mentioned earlier, this wolf moving in Alaska, or this mountain lion as it grows up and patrols its territory in Oregon and the U.S. Tracking these sorts of animals is challenging, but often obtaining the data from the tags is relatively straightforward from a land-based or satellite telemetry for uplinks of the data. As mentioned previously, the ocean is a three-dimensional world and we need to reconsider our two-dimensional bias. These organisms move horizontally and vertically and episodically or possibly never reach the surface where the data from the tag can be relayed to the satellite. As a result, monitoring the movement of marine animals comes with even more challenges. A lot of progress has been made in the 25 year, last 25 years in tracking marine organisms. Those intrepid scientists who study animal movement have developed methods to apply tags and obtain data. 
These images on the right show some examples of animal tagging that has occurred a part, as a part of the TOP program. At the very top, we see a boat carefully approaching a blue whale to insert a barbed tag into the top of the whale in its blubber. A crossbow is used to launch this arrow-like barb into the whale. On the far right is a northern elephant seal with its telemetry tag attached with glue to its head. This animal will eventually molt and shed this tag, but for a period of about a year, the tag will send information to a satellite. At bottom is a blue marlin with a tag just below its dorsal fin, and on the bottom right is a whale shark from New Zealand with the scientists swimming after it, getting ready to attach the tag. Tagging of marine animals provides valuable information about where they are located and when. Also, the sensors collect information about temperature, salinity, and even chlorophyll concentration in the environment. Unlike an Argo float mentioned previously, these tags provide information about what types of conditions these animals prefer. So what are some of the types of tags that are used? As you see here in the imagery at the top, we have an example of a telemetry tag glued to the top of the head of a Weddell Sea. This type of tag can relay back and forth to the satellite, and it collects information such as time, location, speed, depth, temperature, and salinity. Archival tags are for typically those animals that do not come to the surface, like the air breathers, as in the example with the seal. And these instead tend to be more compact because they don't contain all of the um, telemetry uh, electronics. And these are inserted into the animal, as you can see here in the bottom image with the Pacific bluefin tuna. In the center image is Dr. Barbara Block, who is the PI of the tagging of the Pacific pelagics. These collect time, depth, internal and external temperature, and ambient light. Upon commercial harvest, the tag has instructions on the side for the fisher to send the tag back to the researchers for a reward. As mentioned previously, animal tagging data are often used in conjunction with satellite remote sensing data in order to understand why animal movement patterns may be the way they are. The approach of combining tag and satellite data has really helped to leverage the value of either one of them. We can now understand where animals are and give explanations as to what environmental factors may be controlling their movement. This information is extremely valuable for fisheries management, international law, and in describing past conditions. What about forecasting the movement of animals? This is where the power of physical models comes into play. As we touched on earlier, the movement of the ocean can be modeled using first principles of physics. The movement of heat, salt, and material contained with the water can be described with physical models. These physical models can be combined with atmospheric and terrestrial models to describe the general circulation of the globe, which gives us insight into global climate and how it may change in the future. Physical ocean models can help to inform us of the location of the plankton and nectin of the ocean. While the plankton are at the mercy of the ocean currents, the nectin are less so, though they may follow the currents as they follow their prey. Ocean circulation models coupled or combined with remote sensing data and in situ data can be used to forecast how environmental conditions may change in the future, and as a result, we can use that information to predict how animal movement patterns may also change with the changing climate. We will use a case study to examine how in situ data, satellite remote sensing data, and models were used to address the question, how will pelagic predator habitat shift with climate change? This work is described in Hazen et al. 2012 and uses data from top. The study uses input from tagged predators of the northeastern Pacific, and the remote sensing data are listed here, chlorophyllae, sea surface temperature, sea surface height, wind stress, and bathymetry. Some of the species studied are shown on the right and include the sooty shearwater, the lazen albatross shown with its chick, and the mako shark. It used a general circulation model known as the Earth System Model, which includes both an ocean circulation and biogeochemical model. The output was maps of species habitat by season in the year 2100. The study compared present-day species habitat to predicted habitat range to see how climate change may influence these pelagic predator species and how they're distributed in the Northeast Pacific in the future. The tag information was provided through the TOP program. This is an international program to curate tracking data and oceanographic data to observe marine megafauna. One goal of this program is to understand factors influencing animal behavior in the open ocean and to use sensor data in other studies related to climate change and ocean ecosystems. I encourage you to check out the link at the top. 
Some examples of species used in the study included the northern elephant seal, the Laysan albatross, and the great white shark shown here on the bottom right. In the top right, you see a great white shark, great white shark tagging operations off of this small boat near San Francisco, California. I think the sharks are almost the same size as the boat. The study also includes the city shearwater, mako shark, blue shark, and others. Based on the tag data, the researchers observed that there are two biological hotspots in the northeastern Pacific. These are regions where many species aggregate. One is located offshore of San Francisco, California in the California Current, an eastern boundary zone. The other is located farther, located farther offshore and to the north and is named the Transition Zone. These hotspots are by no means permanently fixed. The researchers found that if they shifted in location, that they shifted in location by season. These seasonal shifts were due to changing winds and temperature. The study authors hypothesized that if seasonal variation in temperature and winds could shift these habitat ranges, then how might rising temperatures and intensified winds in this region as predicted under climate change scenarios affect the location and density of habitat? To do their work, to address it, how it may change in the future, they use tagging data and they also use remote sensing data and a general circulation model known as the Earth System Model. This general circulation model couples an ocean circulation model known as the Modular Ocean Model, or MOM, and a biogeochemical model. Using the model input, the study forecast for the year 2100 species distribution and density over the northeastern Pacific at one degree spatial resolution. They did this for each season to see how habitat range may shift due to climate change. If you would like to learn more about the modular ocean model, there's a really great visualization of the Southern Ocean and you can follow the link on the bottom right. So what did the authors find? The upper panels represent their findings for sea surface temperature and chlorophyll in the present day. As you'd expect, the South has warmer water temperatures and they are cooler the farther North. Chlorophyll follows an inverse pattern to temperature, which is typical as warmer waters tend to be nutrient depleted. The lower panels show the difference between the predicted values in 2100 and the present day. In these forecasts, the center of the ocean gyre on the bottom left has heated greatly and the chlorophyll concentration remains high only near the coasts, as you see on the right. This flattening of highly productive waters closer to shore could have a large impact on where the pelagic predators congregate or in how successful they are at navigating through food poor regions during long range migrations. So how will predator habitat change with changing climate? Habitat is predicted, predicted to decline by 2100 for some species in the study and increase for other species. These changes vary by season. While predicted to be so-called winners for some bird species, what is not accounted for is how changing wind patterns may affect bird migration routes. Sea level rise is also expected to have an impact on their breeding grounds on Pacific atolls. Why do we want to know habitat of pelagic predators and how it will shift? We wish to know so that these fisheries can be managed with an eye to the future and also to understand how these natural populations will fare over time. This research study provided an excellent example of how to address a research question with in situ data, remote sensing data, and models. Its results can be used to further address applied science questions, such as how will fishing habitat be altered due to climate change? The answers to these types of questions can then inform policymakers and resource managers. A number of researchers have taken this type of research, like the Hazen article, a step further to develop web tools to be used in near real time by the user community. Their users include resource managers, fishers, and other scientists. Many of the tools highlighted here are the result of NASA-funded applied science research projects. The first tool is the NOAA Whale Watch tool, which has been implemented for the west coast of the U.S. Whales are often at risk from human encounters. These may include ship strikes, entanglement with fishing gear, and loud underwater sounds. The goal of this tool is to reduce those human impacts by providing near real-time information on whale location to mariners, fishers, and others who may have an impact on the animals. The tool uses an ecosystem forecasting method that incorporates historical knowledge of whale migration under varying seasons and environmental conditions. 
in situ information from tagged whales and remote sensing and model estimates for the probability of encountering a whale. You can see here these maps estimating the likelihood of occurrence of a blue whale along the west coast for the month of June 2016. Another tool that is available for resource managers is the Pelagic Habitat Analysis Module. It is a set of software tools designed to assist fisheries managers, scientists, and researchers to examine and predict the habitat for pelagic ocean biota, biota utilizing presence and absence data or abundance data for the biota combined with environmental data sets such as satellite imagery, bathymetry, survey cruises, and ocean circulation models. It is freely available. A third ecosystem forecasting tool is NOAA's Turtle Watch. This tool provides up-to-date information about the thermal habitat of loggerhead sea turtles in the Pacific Ocean north of the Hawaiian Islands. It was created to reduce bycatch of turtles by Hawaii-based long-line fishing vessels. It predicts waters preferred by these turtles based on sea surface temperature and ocean current conditions. <clears throat> In this example, polar bear mothers near the Beaufort Sea near the north slope of Alaska may come ashore to build dens in the winter. If a mother is disturbed during this period, she may abandon her den and the cubs inside. Petroleum operations in the region occur primarily in the winter when the tundra is frozen and it is easier to access the area. Road building occurs during this period and effort is made to avoid building near polar bear dens. If a polar bear den is found along the proposed path of the road, the company must relocate, relocate the road. As warm-blooded animals, polar bears emit heat, and this heat can be sensed through the snow using a number of high and low-tech means. These include the high-tech method of using forward-looking infrared imager, either handheld, as seen in the upper left panel here, or mounted in the nose of a helicopter, as seen on the right, and the data shown in the lower left. This imager senses the heat emitted from the den. In the handheld image in the upper left, you see circled the region in the image where there is a den. It is brighter red on a purple background. For reference, there's a bright white dot to the left of the den. That's an Arctic fox that was walking by when I took this picture. Another means for detecting denning bears is to deploy a field team and their specially trained Karelian bear dogs to sniff out the den. These dogs are extremely accurate in locating dens, but their spatial range is limited. The helicopter surveys using FLIR technology can cover much larger areas and over time are improving in their accuracy. This is an example of a tool that helps both the environment and business. This brings us to our guest speaker, Dr. Mitchell Roffer, and his presentation of Roffer's Ocean Fishing Forecasting Service. Dr. Roffer holds a PhD from the University of Miami Rosenstiel School for Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, Division of Biology and Living Resources. He is the president of ROPS, a scientific consulting company that provides oceanographic analysis for a variety of applications, including fishing, fisheries oceanography, ship routing, and environmental monitoring. We are very pleased to have him here today. He will be describing his ecosystem forecasting tool to improve efficiency in fishing using ocean modeling and satellite remote sensing data. I will now hand over the presentation to him. After his presentation, I will summarize today's presentation, and then we will answer questions. Thank you, Sherry. It was a very informative um, talk you gave before, and some of the information a lot of the information which you provided as background is of the satellites are the ones that we particularly use for our business as well as our research. So I'd like to um, proceed and go and talk about today about the use of satellites and other oceanographic data to provide oceanographic services and products for the fishing industry, oil and gas industry, as well as government and academic researchers. I think in particular today I will focus on my, my NASA and NOAA research projects. The first one that, that occurred though six years ago or so was a work that the, the, the goal was to improve the NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service uh, Atlantic Bluefin Tuna Management Decision Support System. And it was a group of scientists from private industries, from my company, as well as from NOAA, including John Lampkin from University of South Florida, Frank Lucager, 
Sankey Lee from University of Miami, Barlow from Ewing, and a whole host of other people uh, that provided a multi-sector, international, multidisciplinary partnership, uh, including the government fishery scientists and managers. The project that we're finishing up now, was, we leveraged that project to a newer one that we're looking at the management and conservation of Atlantic bluefin tuna again, as well as other highly migratory fish species in the Gulf of Mexico, such as the marlins and other tunas in the Gulf of Mexico, um, and, and um, swordfish. And this is underneath the climate change scenario. So we're looking at regional climate change and habitat models, and this is some of the work that I will review today. Some of the same people that were involved, including John Lampkin, Mula Carter, uh, Barbara Muling, Sankey Lee, etc., uh, are listed here, as well as other collaborators from NOAA, from Spain, um, and Mexico. And the list is growing because the, the project was very successful. The, the research focuses on enhancing the science from management. This is a, a NASA applications interdisciplinary science project. So we're enhancing the science for bluefin tuna, highly migratory species, primarily in the Gulf of Mexico and the surrounding waters. But you'll see um, when we started the project and after we realized that we really had to look at a much larger area. So when we look at the climate domain, which is on the bottom right hand side of the screen, it, it is approximately the nearly the North Atlantic Ocean for we're using for the climate. So we're looking at thousands of kilometers there, and we're, look, we're going down and using um, larvae data, fish larvae data. And on the left side, you'll see the, a picture of a, of a bluefin tuna larvae at six um, millimeters. So it's primarily, we use a lot of satellite in situ data. The satellite data we use is particularly the infrared satellites for sea surface temperature, as well as the ocean color satellites. We did use the altimeters. Um, we, we, we are using 30 years of NOAA, National Fishery Service larvae cruise data, uh, as well as uh, commercial longline data. You look there, um, you'll see a picture of a giant bluefin tuna, over 500 kilograms. That was caught uh, several years ago up in Massachusetts. So part of our work involves the visualization of the ocean currents as discussed previously by Sherry. And this is a, an infrared color image. And if I can learn how to use the pointers here that um, this is a large eddy. Those people have heard of the loop current. This is the loop current. What you're seeing is temperature base, false color enhanced, meaning that the temperature values are put in warmer. The warmer temperature values are put in warmer colors, such as the reds, and the cooler temperatures are put in the blues and the greens. Um, while this is a static image, we recognize certain characteristics of the ocean based on experience. There's a clockwise eddy here. There's another clockwise eddy here. Um, there's another clockwise eddy here and so forth. Um, I don't want you to think that the Gulf of Mexico always looks that way. So here's another typical image of the Gulf of Mexico with the loop current over here. And in this case, we have um, a counterclockwise eddy here, a, another counterclockwise eddy here. There's another counterclockwise eddy here, a clockwise eddy, and so forth. Eddies are important because they transport um, nutrients and, and biological activity from, from the loop current, typically in the center of the Gulf of Mexico, the eastern center of the Gulf of Mexico, all the way west to Texas and, and Mexico, and even as far southwest as Mexico. So, as I said before, we also use ocean color. Here's a case where we use the combination of the MODIS and the VIR sensor together. Clouds are a problem in looking at the ocean from satellites. So here's a case where we combine two satellites to remove the clouds as much as we can so that we can see the ocean features. And here's the loop current. Here's a clockwise eddy pulling Gulf of Mexico water around this eddy. Uh, many times we see this Gulf of Mexico water being pulled along the east side of the loop current. Um, here's a case where we see some higher chlorophyll water being pulled all the way out into the central Gulf. And, and these are clouds. So when you compare an infrared and ocean color image from the same, approximately the same time, same day, you can see a lot of similar features in, 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 the, in both infrared, this clockwise eddy here, as well as ocean color. You can see a similar feature here, another uh, eddy here, as well as over here, 
and, and so forth. The advantage of using the infrared satellites is there more there's more data to remove the clouds so that where you, we have clear skies here, we don't have clear skies in the southeastern part of, uh, excuse me, southwestern part of the Gulf of Mexico west of the Yucatan. Um, a particular interest here is that we can see different things in, using different sensors. So here in infrared, we can see a feature that looks like this, and we're uncertain what the water color is based on the source of the water. However, once you look at the ocean color here, you see it is in fact blue. And when you're starting to look at the movements of fish and understanding your habitat preferences, knowing the color of the water is, is very important. So motion, if we can move to our first movie, we have a challenge with this program to show movies directly, but we, we feel we can do this pretty quickly. So here um, is a movie loop of the Gulf of Mexico and the loop current um, repeating itself. And you notice that it's not static. Things are changing um, when, it, when it's played again. You can see changes in motion in there. So why don't we move to the next slide? There we go. Maybe that, that's fine. And I think maybe there's another movie right after that. So we also use gray tone um, in the Gulf of Mexico, and you, can, you might be able to see the motion a little bit better, particularly in the northeastern Gulf where the loop current is moving and the different features moving around it. Um, if you ever get a chance or, or care to get a copy of these um, videos, I think you, you can get them from, from the class, or you can email me, and I'll be happy to send you some of these uh, videos. So let's go to the next slide, I think, back to the presentation. So what we're trying to understand is the movements and the habitat of these fish so we can understand how things are going to change with climate change. So when we look at and, and start preparing oceanographic analyses for the research crews and developing the habitat models in the Gulf of Mexico and other areas, we use both types of data, both the ocean color and, and the, um, which is the bottom right, versus the infrared which is the top left, and we add arrows to it, and we identify the temperatures and the colors. This helps um, not only fishermen, but research vessels go and decide where we're going to uh, make our sampling. So as part of the sampling is developing the research that we're working on now is looking at the habitat models for the um, highly migratory species that we mentioned previously, both the larvae and adults. And the habitat modeling, what we did was we looked at the catch of the, of the fish, both the larvae and the adults, compared it with a variety of, of satellite as well as in situ data, meaning we're looking at sea surface temperature, temperature at depth, depth of the thermocline, mixed layer depth, which is, off, which is the same, chlorophyll, chlorophyll maximum, subsurface chlorophyll, depth of the water, time of the year, moon phase, etc. This allows us to be able to derive um, models that show us the probability of fish. And looking at the bottom right hand side of um, this slide, you can see that here's a, an infrared satellite image that's been enhanced as well as traced for the strong water mass boundaries or fronts. And then the green line indicates, the green, dotted green is the areas where we think the ship should be sampling because we're trying to develop the model in the Gulf of Mexico. The result of this research comes over in the slide to the top, the left, and here we're looking at the probability of finding larvae, bluefin tuna larvae, in the Gulf of Mexico this particular week in 2014. The highest probability, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, are in the hotter colors, the oranges, and the lower probabilities are in the purples. What's important about the habitat classification, we, we are able to get quantitative probabilities of the catch rates in the Gulf of Mexico for use for larval assessment. And very quickly, what we're trying to do is find an objective means for removing the zeros that are caught in the nets when they do their surveys. So that if if someone would go and put a net in an area here, this is outside the habitat range of the fish in the northern Gulf of Mexico, as shown by the purple. One would not expect to find a larvae, bluefin larvae, in this habitat, which we considered a, um, a desert. One would not expect to find fish in a desert, same in the ocean. These are just to have the too cold, in this case, for the for the bluefin to, to exist, so that we can remove the zeros and get a much more accurate 
uh, and precise measurement of the larval abundance in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, as you can imagine, or perhaps not, that the, the larval habitat is variable from year to year. Warm years is upper left corner, and the, the cooler years are on the right-hand side. And you can see the high probability in the warmer years in May almost fills up the entire Gulf of Mexico, except for the loop current, which is too warm. But in the following year, or the previous year, 2014, we can see that there's less favorable areas in the Gulf of Mexico. So when the catch rates vary in these surveys, these fishery independent surveys, we can explain the variance and we can explain the changes in apparent abundance based on the habitat preferences of the organisms. So if we looked at, as we did, we summarized the different species that, we, that, that our research was involved in. Oxus is the bullet mackerel. We looked at the istiophorids, which is the marlins. This is the sunas species of tunas, yellowfin, big eye, uh, particularly in albacore, the skipjack tuna, katsuanus, bluefin tuna, and swordfish. So you do, as a comparative map for May, what what species are, are more likely to be abundant in, during, during the course of the year. So you can see the higher probabilities of looking at the elephant and big eye, the skipjack, and in, and in May you start to get some bluefin tuna in there, but not nearly as much as you do in other months. Well, what do we, what do we use that for? Well, in the practical uses, we, we use this looking at the effect of the Deepwater Horizon BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. It's a rather complicated slide, so the background, the colors, indicate the probability of where you're likely to find bluefin during the course of the year. Here is the probability in April. Not many bluefin would be expected to be spawning in the Gulf of Mexico in April, so those you get a lot of purple. Now, last week in April, the oil spill started approximately where I have the green arrow. You can see in the following week, uh, a map or the indication of where the oil spill was mapped up here. Now we're looking at the probability of looking at areas where bluefin will be spawning and these are particularly in the greens and the oranges and the X's are areas where the ship, the research vessel we had out there sampling for larvae. We did find some larvae in these areas here where, where we thought the habitat wasn't as good so we have since we find the model. But more importantly, as the spill goes on, we look here, now we have an extensive spill that you see in these shades of gray, and uh, you'll notice that they're occupying a good percentage of the, of the north central Gulf of Mexico. But if you look at the orange, you'll see those are the areas where bluefin tuna are likely to occur. So if you overlap where the oil spill were and where larvae were caught based on our larval survey, and the numbers are given on the right-hand side, you see that a certain portion of the population during the second week of May was affected by the oil spill. However, when you start going out to the third week of May, um, then you see that the larvae are way out here and were not affected by the oil. So when looking at the climate change, it was mentioned before that some species are winners and some species are losers. And very briefly, we see that the, as the habitat changes between the early 2000s and the end of the century, you see that the habitat for bluefin disappears for the adults as well as the larvae, and then for skipjack it actually increases. Now, I don't want to belabor the point. One of the big questions as I end the seminar will be, do bluefin do to spawn outside the Gulf of Mexico? So if we looked at the habitat models, in 2013, you'll notice that there is probability of habitat out here. So what we did is we sent the ship out and we looked and they sampled here and we found 16 positive stations for bluefin tuna in the Bahamas. What we then did is we tried to, where they in fact spawned in the Gulf of Mexico, we don't like to use models to look at that, we like to use the real-time data. If you're going to use models, you really need to know their limitations. We use something called the branching coherent structures, which basically is following the water masses and the shape of the water masses as they move throughout the Gulf. Now, I, I want to get a chance, if I have just a moment, to show this, this movie here, which is important if, if we can flip off the slide. I know I'm running out of time, but um, if we can't get it, yeah. So it's, it's pretty neat to see the movements of the Gulf Stream, what you're looking at here is the Gulf Stream off the east coast of Florida and how the currents are moving. 
unfortunately today it's just not working very well with the with the program so we're going to move to the next slide and let's forget about this one but if you could see this thing everything was moving and flowing and just just showing you that the flow of the water comes from basically South Florida up into the Bahamas and so forth. Um, so what we ended up doing is we started doing a, what we call backtracking. And what that meant was we looked at, looking at movies, we looked at satellite movies of, of, of where the larvae were caught, which I think was down here, and then we backtracked to see where the larvae might have moved from, where were they spawned in order to reach that single point. And this will be the last movie of, of, of my presentation. So the larvae were caught right down that one single dot right here. And the other possible spawning areas, if we backtrack the larvae, looking at all the patterns in the motion of the water, were here, here, and there. If we can play the movie one or two more times, we might be able to just get a sense on how fast things move in this area. If it doesn't play, then so be it. So anyhow, if you've moved your hand and moved a lot, you can follow the path of these larvae in the currents into this spot. Let's just move to the next slide. So the result of the research, so based on our assumptions and tracking, 16 bluefin were definitely spawned in the Bahamas, one in the Gulf Stream, one either in the Gulf Stream Bahamas, and two in the Gulf of Mexico were transported. So the answer to the big question was, yes, bluefin were spawned in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not going to go through all these references, but here are the papers that were pre we presented and were published. So with that, I'll end my part of the seminar and turn it back over to Sherry. Thank you, Mitch, or excuse me, Dr. Brockford, uh, for your presentation. I find your work really fascinating. So I really appreciate you coming and talking to our participants. Um, in a couple of minutes, we'll start answering questions. Uh, but I just want to do just a quick review of what we talked about today. Uh, let's see. All right, we reviewed concepts from last week. I gave a background on movement in the ocean, satellite sensors used to measure sea surface height and temperature to use in mapping currents and estimating velocity. I also talked about why and how we tag marine animals. I reviewed a case study of how marine animal movement has been monitored through a program called Tagging of Pelagic Predators and how information from this large international effort has changed our understanding of migration patterns of large ocean megafauna. We reviewed ecosystem forecasting tools developed for marine animals, and this included whale watch, turtle watch, and the pelagic habitat analysis module. And we had this really wonderful and very interesting presentation by our special guest, Dr. Mitchell Roffer. I want to thank you for your participation. As a reminder, next week we will be discussing coral reefs, and we will now answer questions. Okay. So there's a question here about Turtle Watch. The Turtle Watch tool was developed for the region north of the Hawaiian Islands. There may be other turtle-related tools that are out there. Um, I can do a little re bit of research on this. If you want to send me an email to, um, to ask me for this, my email is in the, um, the information at the beginning of this presentation. Um, but the one that I presented is just for the, um, for the Pacific. So, so we use a lot of the data, if there aren't many other questions, we use a lot of this similar data to forecast fish for both recreational and commercial fishermen around the world looking at frontal boundaries of the satellite. And we look at it at the frontal boundaries. These are the places where you see large changes in temperature and color, and this due to the convergence of the waters, they concentrate plankton and then um, smaller fish and larger fish. We also use these kind of data to track and map the currents so that we can put vessels, particularly vessels that are being towed around the world, in the proper current in areas where they can avoid um, negative currents or currents that are pushing against them. So if you have a ship that can only move six or eight miles an hour on the ocean, you don't want to be going into a current that's pushing against you at four miles an hour. So what we do is map the currents and provide this to the captain so they can 
avoid the, the negative currents. So Dr. Rothford, do you have any additional slides that you might like to show us? I know that you've prepared quite a few uh, and you, your group does some really interesting work. Yeah, sure. I, I can go through some quickly without going into great detail on, on these slides. I always like to prepare some extra slides to, in anticipation of questions or if I go too fast and I have extra time. So, um, so let's jump to the next one. So when we look at a, a station selection, here's a case where we were, we were, pro were providing support to Dr. Bob Uter from Moat when he was trying to tag sharks. We're looking at the, the loop current here, and then based on the changes, in fact, this was from the movie I showed before, that the eddy is turning in a, in a clockwise direction, and the water's changing and moving, but we wanted to put stations here, 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 so he could try to sample as much of the different water column and different water masses where he could to find sharks to tag and do some basic biology on them. As I, as I said just very quickly, looking at the oil and gas industry, uh, when you're moving platforms across the ocean for repair or installation, um, you want to avoid these very strong currents. So we provide this information in, in oceanographic types charts. Here's one off of the northeast coast of South America, um, Venezuela, where we show the arrows indicate the flow of the water. We provide temperatures, indication of the eddy. A uh, particular client um, was drilling, I think, over here somewhere, um, and they wanted to make sure they don't get an eddy. Because an eddy will give you anywhere from four to five miles an hour of current, and if you're not prepared for one of these eddies to hit your rig, your oil rig, you can break the pipes and have a terrible spill, and also they lose a lot of money in repairing it and getting back to, to drilling. So it's a matter of losing millions of dollars a day. There's a case where we do some ship routing, and again, um, we put arrows indicating the, the, of course, my arrow is opposite where the correct arrow should be, but the, uh, the direction, the route that we think that the captain should take, taking advantage of these currents that are going in a clockwise direction here or in, in the northeast. And similar to what we do here off of Madagascar and, and East Africa, the same principles. Um, the green is, is favorable, areas of green, reds are unfavorable. And ship riding again in the Gulf of Mexico, it's the same thing. We provide drilling support. Here's a combination slide looking at infrared imagery, looking at, at, at subsurface measurements by the oil industry uh, in the, on some of the platforms they have there, it's giving the current speed and direction. And again, it's all about details. So here's a case where someone was not paying attention to details and the platform, which is worth, I don't even know, billions of dollars, sank on installation. So um, I won't get involved in this slide. It takes a little bit too long <laughs> to describe. Um, but we, we're called by different people to track currents for them or looking at clouds to see if an area was cloudy or not. We had, unfortunately were involved in a, a search and rescue for two York, lost um, teenagers off of Florida last year and um, we provided maps and indicated to airplanes and ships where they're likely to have been taken by the current so that when you go start looking for people in large areas of the ocean you have a better sense rather than blindly following um, your intuition. Well, thank you, Mitch. I think that um, we would like to take just one more question. I'm sorry to step in there and interrupt you. Uh, we had uh, one question about how um, do currents, how might they be changing in a changing climate? And I don't know if you want to address that question or you want me to address it. This is one of the things we're studying. And for example, if I take a look at this satellite image here, which is off the east coast of Florida, this is Cape Canaveral, Jacksonville, Florida is here all the way up to South Carolina, these eddies, and, and they come in different sizes and shapes. Now, we're wondering that with climate change, with the change, if there will be one, a change in the speed of the Gulf Stream, and if in fact it does slow down, as, as some models suggest, then the size of these eddies are likely to change. Well, this is important because if you have a small eddy, it only brings in a small filament closer to the coast. If you have a large eddy, it brings in the Gulf Stream water much closer to the coast, 
And this is important for turtle migrations because they ride the currents, for birds where they're likely to be feeding, for fishermen knowing where to catch fish, and for managers to understand changes in catch rates. So we are looking at this, we're seeing, we are seeing patterns of change now. The question is, are they just short-term trends or are they long-term changes? All right. And I suspect they'll take 10 years or more to, to see if they are in fact real. Thank you so much, Dr. Roffer, for providing so much information and for answering questions of our enthusiastic participants. We've reached the end of our webinar series, or excuse me, of the session today. As a reminder, we have one more session next week, and we will be talking about coral reefs. And I wanted to thank everyone for participating and extend a special thank you to Dr. Roffer for such an interesting presentation. Thank you.